well, it's me again. If you're getting tired of Eva singing, you let me know, okay? Because then we need to have a conversation. What a blessing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. It's a, it's a beautiful, th beautiful thing when you use these talents for the Lord. And thank you, Dr. Lopez, for playing. That was lovely as well. Um, boy, it feels like it's been an entire week since we've been together. I don't know about you, but it, uh, it's amazing how much things get packed into a single week of time sometimes. But that's why the Sabbath is a time to rest. That's why the, ta the Sabbath is an opportunity to refocus, to take that deep breath and say, okay, Lord, I'm yours now once again. What do you have for my life? Would you pray with me? God in heaven, we, we seek your blessing, Father. And I know we, we use that phrase quite flippantly at times, but we really do seek your blessing your direction, your wisdom, your joy, your power. And Father, if we try to live this life outside of that, it just is not a success. It doesn't work out. So God, as we submit our hearts to you today, God, may your voice be heard and may your spirit be felt in this place. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I am... Um, I started a, a very short two-part sermon last week, and this is part two. And I, I realize you always run the gamble of doing a sermon series. Some pastors live and die by series, you know. They can do a 20-part you know, series on Galatians, and that's fine. That's never been my style to necessarily go uh, that systematically. Um, usually it's, it's between two and four uh, combined thoughts together over a sort uh, over a a span of time. I think the longest series I did um, was with my associate pastor where we went through pretty much the book of John together and we did that for about four months leading up to, um, to Easter. Um, but the reason I mention that is that at a, at a church like this, when you have something like um, a home leave, we have a very different congregation from week to week. Um, but that's why I'm glad we have our video ministry. I'm thankful for our team back there, even though the internet may not be working. Robert, is it still a thumbs down? <laughs> still going to be recorded and posted. So um, for those that missed it, uh, are missing it now, uh, but, but wanted to hear it, I'm glad it'll be available that way. I'm just going to jump right into my kids quiz this morning as we follow up from where I left off from last week in uh, Acts chapter 16. So uh, for the young people here, I just want your assistance for just a few moments. We're going to be looking at one individual that uh, comes up in the story next uh, in Acts chapter 16, and it is a woman by the name of Lydia. Acts 16 introduces us to a person named Lydia. What do we know about her? Okay, and so I'm going to put some things on up here. Do we, where was she from? Do you remember the story? It tells us right there in Acts 16. They're in the city of Philippi, but she's not from Philippi. She's from somewhere else. Do you remember? I'll give you a hint. It's one of the seven churches of Revelation. Leah? Yeah, Thyatira. It's almost, it's a, almost a hard word to say. You kind of have thyroid in there, Thyatira, that type of thing. Um, she's from Thyatira. Um, which is in the region of Lydia, okay? That is where she's from. She's literally from Lydia, and her name is Lydia. And it's, it brings up an interesting question. Is her name Lydia, or did she just get called Lydia? Because that's where she's from. We do that today. If you're from Texas, someone might call, hey, they're Tex, right? If you're from Jersey, hey, this is one of my, you know, the Jersey boys over here. We do that now. Okay, and because she's a businesswoman, it's very possible that she accepted that title. I'm from Thyatira. I'm from Lydia. You want to call me Lydia? If that helps us have this business relationship, I'm perfectly fine with that. It's, it's very possible um, that that was the relationship there. We don't know. It's a lovely name either way. It's Lydia from Thyatira, which is in the region of Lydia. What was her occupation? Taylor? She sold purple. How do you make a living selling a color, Taylor? Okay, you know that, right. Yeah, it, it actually means she sold purple dyes, purple fabric. Now, this is actually a very important 
thing to understand about the story. This means she is serving a very elite community. Only the wealthiest bought, owned, and used the color purple. It was a very expensive process to make. It was a symbol of nobility and royalty to have purple furniture or even to have purple things, um, you know, hemmed around your, your clothing or something was a status symbol. So we understand that Lydia uh, is a seller of purple. This tells you something about her. She is not a common day. You know, I, I really looked for good uh, drawings and pictures and artistic descriptions of Lydia. I really couldn't find any that really matched what we see from the Bible, from the Bible, from the Bible, <laughs> because it always makes her look almost like a humble peasant, very simple. That is not what the, a seller of purple would be at all. She would have been decked out. She would have been, uh, you know, very high class. Okay. Um, and, and people who buy purple, they don't buy their t-shirts at Walmart, okay? They go down Scottsdale here, uh, and they find some of these very nice places, and that's where they buy. This, this would be similar to buying like Gucci, all right, or Louis Vuitton. Um, you know, it's interesting, even the names today continue to be Italian, and she's serving a Roman uh, or an Italian province there. Uh, what are some other ones? You know, you go there a lot, uh, Brendan. Sorry to pick on Armani, right? Yeah. Uh, 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 Panini, uh, Rivaderce, I don't know, what are the, you know. This is very high class stuff, okay? We know that Lydia is, is uh, affluent just by that statement alone. Okay, kids, I need your help a little bit more here. Now, in the story, Paul and Silas interact with or they meet Lydia at a particular place. Where do they meet Lydia? Okay, Owen? Outside of the city gate near the what now? Near the river. That's right. They meet her at a riverside. Now, I'm, I'm using this quiz as another way of just kind of getting into the details of the story. And this is important for us to recognize. As Paul and Silas, and we know that Luke and Timothy were also with them. We know that. The Bible says that. Paul wanted to take Timothy, and Luke says, so we set out from Troas. He includes himself in the first person. So it's not just Paul and Silas. There's a little cohort that is going over to Philippi. This is the first incursion of Christian missionaries going into Europe, okay? And as they go in, normally they would always go where first? They would go to the synagogue, right? If you remember in the book of Acts, always first they would go to the synagogue. It's very interesting here in Philippi, they don't go to the synagogue, which tells us there probably wasn't a synagogue, okay? Which also tells us there was not a significant Jewish presence in Philippi. It takes 10 married men, historically, to form a synagogue, all right? If there were 10 married Jewish men, they could establish a synagogue. And so we know there's no significant Jewish presence, and that's why Paul and Silas, excuse me, on the Sabbath day, seek out a place where maybe there would be at least a few people who are honoring the Sabbath and who are seeking an opportunity to worship might be found, okay? Little, little part of the story there. All right, number four. So they meet her and they talk with her. How does she respond to the message of Paul and Silas and their team? Did she reject it? Did she get upset? What did she do? Do you remember in the story of Lydia? Some of the young people here, I could really use your help. Is this one too difficult? Is this one, is this one a struggle? How did she respond? Mom, Dad, you can whisper if you want to help. <laughs> okay, we're, yes, that's right. But before even that, do you remember she accepted? She accepted, and she's actually baptized. She becomes the very first European... I mean, it, it, to use kind of a modern way of looking at it, to get baptized into the church of Jesus Christ. It's Lydia, and it says, and her whole household. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Okay, and then Mrs. Herber answered the, the next part of the question for us. That's exactly right. She invited them home. And I think I've said this before, uh, if I've not said it. In the book of Acts, the author Luke, nearly every time someone joins the church... They eat together. 
They, <laughs> I heard an amen, yeah. And the, the process of eating together was just as sacred and intimate as anything that could be done. If you did not eat with someone in the ancient world, you almost you know, didn't have a relationship with them. So not only, just look in your Bibles, virtually every time it says, and they were baptized, it says, and they ate together. Just, you know, or, or they, they took their meals or they went door to door, you know. So um, the, the, the act of eating together uh, almost always coincides with joining the church and being baptized. So that was just, you know, I put the, uh, the, the text in purple, if you can see that. Isn't that pretty? And by the way, it says she is a seller of purple. It doesn't necessarily mean she was always wearing it. And that was another part, problem I have with all the artistic descriptions. It always has Lydia wearing purple all over. Now, maybe she did because that's what she sold, but it doesn't necessarily go hand in hand. Okay, we're going to get into the story. But again, I just, I like to know where we're at. And so I put this map up last week. Here's where Jerusalem is. Okay, Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council. Paul and Silas, they take their missionary journey and they go all the way to Philippi. That's where we are. Now, by the way, Thyatira was almost right on their route. Thyatira, this is the region of Lydia right here. And Thyatira, it's not on this map, but it would be basically right on that line um, that, that, that this map shows. So it gives you an idea of where we are uh, geographically. And uh, again, just one more thought um, from Spirit of Prophecy because I enjoy hearing uh, these messages also. This is from Christ's Object Lessons. Please read this and just think about it as I read it. For his church, in every generation, God has a special truth and a special work. The truth that is hid from the worldly wise and prudent is revealed to the childlike and humble. It calls for self-sacrifice. It calls for whatever this special truth is, whatever this special work is, it calls for self-sacrifice. Sacrifice. It has battles to fight and victories to win. And at the outset, its advocates are few. By the great men of the world and by the world-conforming church, they're opposed and despised. And then I put an ellipsis there. She first mentions John the Baptist as an example. But the very next example that she lists here as an example of a church with a special work and self-sacrifice, she says this, See the first bearers of the gospel into Europe. How obscure, how hopeless seemed the mission of Paul and Silas, the two tent makers, as they, with their companions, took ship at Troas for Philippi. She specifically says, if you want to understand a little bit about how to understand your mission and your special work and your, and your um, obligation to self-sacrifice, contemplate the mission of Paul and Silas in Philippi. Okay? This is not just one story among many. This is what I'm trying to illustrate. In many ways, Philippi is the crux. It is the central story of the book of Acts. It is the result of the church learning we can no longer keep this to ourselves. It is no longer a Jewish thing, this Jesus Messiah that we worship. It is something that must go to the world. Philippi is the story that we come to. So I'm, I'm going to leave it on that screen. I don't have the verses in, uh, on the screen. If you have your Bibles, open them up with me, okay, on your phones, your tablets, or if you have uh, um, these things called books, you can use them as well. All right? Acts chapter 16, and we're going to go ahead and back up of the story just a little bit to verse 11, uh, so we dovetail a little bit with uh, the introductory part of last week. Acts chapter 16 and verse 11. So putting out from the sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and on the day following to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. And it's going to be important in just a few minutes to acknowledge. And we were staying in this city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. So um, Luke is telling us, Luke was there, all right? He says, we went from Troas. And as I shared last week, I think it's a good possibility that Luke was the man of Macedonia. But anyways, um, they go and they meet these women at the riverside to pray. In verse 14, a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. 
Okay? In just two brief verses here, we're given a, 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 a description of the first convert in Europe. It's a woman named Lydia, and it says, and her whole household, okay? which again was very customary in the ancient world and much of the modern world. If the matriarch or patriarch of the family makes a decision, everyone else follows along. Okay? Now, we know just from the description here, she is an affluent woman. We also know that she is called, quote, a worshiper of God. Now, this is a very specific phrase that Luke uses along with God-fearers throughout Acts um, and even in the Gospel of Luke. This means she is not a Jew. She's not, or a Jewess, to be more accurate. She's not a Jewess. She is a convert. She is a worshiper of God. That was a specific phrase. It's not just an anecdote. It's not just a way, uh, uh, just a general description. It has a specific meaning. Okay? She was not born into Judaism. She had abandoned whatever pagan religion had been uh, a part of her culture, and she had accepted the, uh, the, the, the God of the Jews. That's why on the Sabbath day, she saw a place to interact with people of like mind. Okay? So we know quite a bit about Lydia. It's amazing how much we know about her in two short verses. There's a lot of important people in the Bible that we don't know their name, and we don't know where they're from, and we don't know a lot about them that did amazing things. But Lydia, we know a lot about. She's a woman, she's rich, and she is a convert. Okay? That's the first, a convert to, to Judaism, okay? And now a convert to Messianic Judaism, or to Christianity, we might say. Okay? That's an awful lot of knowledge. Now, it says that, they wel that she welcomed them into her house. She owns a home, okay? And she's from Thyatira. Now, that she may have immigrated, but we know that Thyatira was the main production factory of purple dye. She probably had land and property in both places, and she's a merchant traveling, okay? Now, some of this gets a little bit into inference, Okay, but it does go along with the story. Now, notice, too, that it says her, her whole household. She probably had servants, workers, cooks, maids. Okay, this, probably, this could have been a group of several dozen or more. Now, there's a little uh, side note I want to make here. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't want to make here, Caleb, so we'll talk about it later. It has to do with uh, the the biblical idea of the house church, but I don't think that's going to be as necessary to mention right here. Just know in your mind what we know so far about Lydia. This is the first foundational member and her household of the Christian church in Europe. Now notice how Luke will contrast that with the next story. And Luke loves to do this. He loves in his stories to contrast uh, two things at once. If you follow along in Luke and Acts, you'll see it quite often. So the next story happens in verse 16. It happened that as we were going, if you're with me, Acts 16 and verse 16. It happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us who was bringing her masters much profit and fortune telling. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying. Here, Luke, again, us. Luke is there. Following along after us, um, she kept crying out, These men are bond servants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued doing this for many days, and Paul was greatly annoyed and turned to the said, and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And at that very moment, it came out of her. Now you have these two ladies introduced to us. And this is intentional. This is part of the story of the church of Philippi and why it's so foundational to our understanding of the church in general. And... Um, uh, there, there's a lot of details here. I, I want to try to keep right to the, um, the relevant parts here. As, as Paul is going through this, uh, uh, Philippi is on a major trade route to Delphi. And Delphi is where it was a spiritual center of the world. There was an oracle in Delphi. Any of you know your history? You've heard of the oracle of Delphi. And people, it was like a, a pilgrimage. People would go to Delphi. All right, are my crops going to be good this year? I don't know. Let's go to the Oracle of Delphi. Um, is my health going to improve? Well, we better go to the Oracle of Delphi. We don't really have a modern equivalent to a, a holy center. I mean, the Catholics have Rome and the, um, the Muslims have Mecca. In, in the Protestant church, we don't really have these spiritual centers. You know, we have our church and things like that. But in the ancient world, Delphi was a major uh, thing, all right? It was a spiritual center, and Philippi was on the route to that. And this is what it's talking about with this, um, uh, uh, the oracle would uh, babble phrases and then people would interpret it and, and people thought that 
Um, that was wonderful, and, and they were predicting the future. But this slave girl is in that same spirit, okay? And it says, now let's just note what we know about her, okay? She's a slave girl. Now, the Greek word for girl, there's a specific word. It doesn't just mean a female. It actually means what you might use in the old language of damsel, of marrying age but not married. She's not a child, nor is she a grown woman, okay? She's probably in her teens, uh, late teens, maybe early 20s, but again, Greek would cease to use that term for a young woman in her 20s. If you weren't married by 20 in, in the Greek world, in the ancient world, you know, it's kind of a questionable deed at that point, okay? So we know she's young. We know that she's a slave. Now, where your Bible says spirit of divination, in Greek, it says pneuma puthona or pneuma puthon. Pneuma, spirit, pneumatic, you know, pneumonia, air, pneuma, all right? Puthon, python. It literally says she has the spirit of a python. Now, that's just an ancient idiom and metaphor because the guardian of the gates of, of Delphi was the god, a python god, and there would be statues of pythons. That's where the, the, uh, um, the temple of Apollo was in, in Delphi, and, and one of the symbols of the guardian of the temple of Apollo was a python. So it literally says she has the spirit of a python, which means the god python was speaking through her. Okay? Now, there's one other thing that is not in the Bible, but is highly likely. There's at least a 50% chance that she's black. There's at least a 50% chance that she's black. I can share that with you for a couple of reasons. I told you last week that Philippi was a major retirement city established by Augustus Caesar for veterans of the Legion armies. Okay? Most of the Romans living there had retired from the army. Okay, and we're living in Philippi. And the major military campaigns of Augustus Caesar, which would have been the campaigns of these Roman soldiers who were living there, were mostly in North Africa. Okay, in Tunisia, Algeria, Libya, and Egypt. And part of the payment of Roman soldiers was slaves. And the normal procedure when you conquered a people was to take slaves. And Roman soldiers were paid at their retirement in three ways. They were paid with slaves, they were paid with land, and they were paid with salt. So again, I don't force this upon you. I can't prove it. Just historically, there's a high likelihood that the slaves living in Philippi, belonging or had been previously belonging to Roman soldiers, were acquired during those African, North African campaigns of Rome um, during the time of Augustus Caesar, which also may have been the reason why she was not in Delphi, but was actually up in Philippi, okay? Now, again, we don't know that. We don't know as much about this slave girl as we know about Lydia. We don't know her name, okay? But what we do know about her is that there is a big gap between her and Lydia from the world's perspective, okay? She's a slave, Lydia's affluent, okay? She's filled with a demon. Lydia is a God worshiper, okay? Um, Lydia is probably more mature, probably um, had been married before, uh, a young slave girl. Big difference between these two, right? Now, I find it interesting. Uh, when Paul, it says that after many days, Paul being annoyed, you know, spoke to the demon, and I've heard people say, well, why didn't he do that day one? You know, if you see someone and you have the ability to, to bring relief into their life, why didn't he do it day one? And we know that Paul was following the dictates of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit knows more about these things than we do. But I would share this with you. I read one commentary that said, when Paul drove out that spirit, there's no uh, uh, proof that she immediately became a follower of Jesus. You know, maybe that spirit was just driven out, and she said, thank you very much, and she went on her way. I have a real problem with that because the Bible says, Jesus says in the, in the book of Matthew that when a spirit is driven out, it goes through arid places, seeking a place of rest, finding none, it returns to its house and finding its house swept and clean and in good order, it finds seven demons more vile than itself. It goes back into the house so that the state of that person is worse off than it was before. You see what I'm saying is that if Paul had driven out that spirit without understanding that that young girl was ready to receive a holier spirit, he would not have been doing her a service. He would have been hurting her. And so um, in Acts of the Apostles, Ellen White says very clearly, she became part of the church in Philippi. 
This is important to understand. It would have harmed her for Paul to drive out that spirit without an, a, an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to take the place of that spirit. By the way, there's another uh, very important principle here. God knows when you're ready to be healed. Some people say, God, if you would just get rid of this debt, oh, I'm in such debt right now, all oh, this problem. If you just get rid of it, God knows if he was to eliminate it right then and there, whether or not you'd learn your lesson or you just go get into deeper debt the next day. When you take a test that you haven't studied for, kids, and you say, Lord, just help me through this one test. I didn't study. I had time, but I chose to play video games. I chose to watch TV. But just help me through this test. God knows if he helps you through that test, whether you're going to learn your lesson or for the next test, you'll say, hey, I didn't study for the last one. Not going to study for this one. It'll be just fine. You understand what I'm saying? God knows. And God knew when it was ready for this young slave girl to receive a better spirit. So you have the first two identified members of the European church in juxtaposition, Lydia and a slave girl. And you probably couldn't imagine two more different people than these two. But they are the beginnings of the church in Europe. But there's one more story that we're probably a lot more familiar with in Acts 16. And so you'll remember, and I'm not going to read all the verses related to it, but so the owners of this slave girl, they see that she is no longer babbling with the spirit of the python, and they get upset, and they throw a fit, and it says, when her master saw their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, I'm in verse 19, dragged them to the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews. Now, you cannot escape what the Bible is clearly trying to illustrate as the early church uh, uh, dealing with the issue of race. That was the issue. Paul and Silas being Jews coming into a city. Why did they bring Timothy? Why did Luke join them? Luke was a Gentile. Timothy had a father who was a Greek and a mother who was a Jew. So he was a kind of an in-betweener. But they became kind of the guides to Paul and Silas to navigate how do we bring the gospel to these people who are not like us. And, and as they do their work and as they bring this miracle into the life of this slave girl, it is the people of the city who make race an issue. You see, outside the walls of the church, race is an issue. But within the church, it is not an issue. But for those outside, they say they're making problems because of their race. They are not like us. Therefore, they can't be trusted. And it's essential for the church to understand that if these divisions exist within the church, they will be just as destructive to the ability of Jesus Christ to bring freedom to his children as we see the destructiveness of these issues outside the church. So there's this big uh, problem. Paul and Silas are beaten, they're imprisoned, and they're sent to a jail in Philippi. And the jailer is instructed, these men are trouble, you better not let anything happen to them. And verse 24 says, and having received such a command, he threw them into the inner prison, fastened their feet with stocks. And you all know the story. Paul and Silas in prison, weeping, crying, crying out for relief, no. Paul and Silas said, if the Lord so wanted us to be in prison, then there must be some prisoners who need me. And again, there's so many principles here. Sometimes you wonder, why, God, are you putting me in this circumstance? Why am I in the hospital? Why am I here? Why am I being treated unfairly? God always has a reason. Maybe you're in that hospital because you're there to bless someone. Maybe you're in the principal's office to, to bless someone. You never know what plans the Lord has. But Paul and Silas in prison lift up their voice in song. It's a beautiful thing. Many sermons and illustrations can be drawn out of that. And again, there comes an earthquake and all the chains fall off. 
In verse 27, when the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Now, just don't want to rush over this too quick. He's ready to die. And we know he has a family. We know he has a family. We read that later on. This family man understands that under Roman law, if he's found negligent in his duty, they will publicly execute him, and it will be a humiliating thing, a shaming thing to his family. And under that context and in that culture, it would have been more appropriate for him just to commit suicide right then and there. They would kind of sweep it under the rug and say punishment has been done, and, and you know, uh, they would come up with some story, oh, robbers came in the night and freed the prisoners and tried to save Roman face and all that. He's ready to die. This family man with children, but then a voice cries out. Verse 28. Do not harm yourself. We are all here. Not just Paul and Silas, but every prisoner in that jail. Doors open, chains falling off, they're all there. And in that moment, that man's life is saved. He called for lights, rushed in, trembling, fell down with fear, and said before Paul and Silas, and said, um, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Powerful story. Oh. They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, you'll be saved, you and your whole household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him, together with all who were in his house. He took them that very hour of the night, washed their wounds. Immediately he was baptized, he and all his house food. Now notice this, and he set before them food. Food is always there. Makes me happy. And here we have the third story of who is going to join this church in Philippi. Lydia an unnamed slave girl, formerly demon-possessed, and now a Roman, a Roman jailer. These are the first identified, and his family, members of the church in Europe. Not a Jew among them that we know of. Females, Formerly demon possessed, a, a jailer of the Roman society? Do you see how unique this experience of the church really is? Do you see how the power of the gospel changes people's perceptions? And no longer do these things that separate us in the world, affluence, socioeconomic differences, racial language barriers. In Jesus Christ, we are all one. Again, when you just think, oh, and we know that there were probably others. You think about those other prisoners in jail. And again, it's just totally conjecture. I can't force it upon you. But you just wonder if a handful of those prisoners also saw that earthquake and also heard Paul and Silas singing and also saw that Roman fall down and say, what must I do? And it's just a few of them also may have been listening and says, yeah, maybe I need that as well. This is the proto-church in Europe. And of course, they're released and there's a big... Uh, embarrassment when they find out that they're Romans. Um, they, they appeal for them to leave the city secretly, even though they've been beaten in public. Verse 40, last verse of the chapter. They went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they saw the brethren, already there's a group of them, they encouraged them and departed and went off. Friends, I... I know that you've studied these verses before. Maybe all of this is just a reminder. You've seen it before. You know it before. But in our day and age, you know, it's, we're not so different today than humanity has been in the past. We think that we're so intelligent. We think that we're so, uh, you know, enlightened. We still struggle with these things. And we still struggle with identifying where I fit in the family of God. Think of these individuals once more 
how different they were. How everything about the world around them would tell them, you don't belong in the same room together. You don't belong in the same status together. But when they saw who Jesus was, all of a sudden those differences no longer mattered. Philippi illustrates to us the power of the gospel to remove all ethnic, economic, social, we could put a lot of other identifiers there, cultural boundaries that separate us. The first church in Europe is a model for how the last church on earth will look. It will be powerful, successful, it will be spiritual, and it will be comprised of everyone. It will be comprised of everyone. And it is our privilege in this messed up world, in this backward society, to offer our community something different. In our church, we are one. We are brothers and we are sisters. And we do not judge ourselves or measure ourselves or identify as a primary reality of ourselves these minimal things. Paul would write in the book of Philippians, and I close with this, he would write a letter to this early church, and in the very beginning of that book, he says this, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. When was that first day? It was that Sabbath day that Paul met Lydia at the riverside. And from that first day until now, that Philippian church continued to be a powerful movement in the early Christian world. I am confident of this very thing, Paul says, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Have I made my point? Have I been too indirect about it or have I said it directly? It is a beautiful thing to be part of such a diverse community. There is no community on earth as diverse as the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Did you know that? There is no community on earth as diverse as the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And a lot of it goes back to our passionate understanding of who Jesus is and how he removes these barriers in our world. Friends, our kids and our society is bombarding us with the opposite message. Social media, entertainment, the public education system is bombarding our society that these things must be paramount. We need to have another voice in that discussion. I hope that the Holy Spirit empowers you and blesses you to be one who can communicate this beautiful gospel truth and that many will come to be baptized and join this church. Let's pray together. God in heaven, Lord, there are innumerable additional and significant lessons to be learned in this story. But God, I pray in just a small way you will continue to use your word and your spirit to impress upon us this beautiful truth that we have in these last days. As the world continues to tear itself apart, as people continue to define themselves in ways that are only divisive, Father, I pray that within your people and among your people, we would understand that we are all your children and that you love us equally and that we are more powerful together than we are separated. So, Father, thank you so much for being with us today. Bless us, Lord, as we seek to do your will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here. God bless you. Just a little reminder, next week, special service with Pastor Jonathan Smith. The TAA uh, team will be leading that service. So hope that you come out for that as well. Lord bless you.